Okay, John, are you there? Hey, Bob, what are you doing, buddy? I'm talking to the one and only, the legendary John Reagan, who called my little show. Thank you so much. It's good to hear from uh, you. My pleasure, my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this all week. Oh, it's such a, it's, it's really, it's an honor for me. I've really, I've just been getting some really great guests starting this year, and you're one of the ones I've been really excited about, and, uh, you know, I was talking to Robert Fleischman last week from Journey and Vinnie Vincent, and I was like, you know, you have this you have this thing where, you know, you've got this massive following of the Journey family and the Kiss family. And, John, you even go further. I mean, you, of course you've got the Kiss family. I mean, the Kiss army loves you because your connection with Ace. But then you've got the connection to Peter Frampton. You've got the connection to Billy Idol, too. And it just goes on and on. Um, but my first question is, of course, I like to ask them, I guess, is how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing great. Uh, you know, it's... Uh it's interesting you mention all of that, and it's 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 been a, a wonderful ride so far. I'm I'm absolutely a blessed man to be able to have uh, worked with all of those great people, uh, you know, one way, shape, or form. Uh, and you did mention the Kiss fans, and, and I have to say, out of all the fans I've ever met, and I've said this going all the way back to uh, when we started Fraley's Comet. They are the greatest fans on the face of the earth and in the known universe. I would think so. I would think so. Absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, it's like... Dedicated, uh, just wonderful people. I mean, does it how, how I mean, how many days does it go? Like, how many days is like is it, uh, is it daily that you get an ace question? Is it always like, well, what about this with Ace, ace Fraley? Or da, 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 da. Yeah, well, with Facebook, obviously, yeah. it, I, I spend way too much time on <laughs> Facebook. But I really like connecting with everyone. That was the thing I used to enjoy about going to the Kiss conventions. Uh, and and Facebook is like a you know a global Kiss convention for those fans, especially. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I get them on a daily basis. It's always great to talk about them. It was a wonderful <laughs> period of my life. Uh, you know, we had a great time. We we made some some good music too, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind doing it again. You never know. Well, there was the rumor. Nice. I remember you and Todd were talking on Facebook, I, and a lot of us were getting excited. It's like, wouldn't it be cool to get a Fraley's Comet reunion? I'm like, oh yes, absolutely. Todd, you know, we're. I don't know if that's going to work with Ace. I've, I've talked to him about it. Uh, not this past October, the one prior to that, he was at the Chiller Convention in New Jersey, and the uh, first time we had actually uh, been in the same room together for a while. He'd, he's out on the West Coast now. Right. I told him I'd love to do it. You know, he said, ah, yeah, the money's got to be right. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand that, but um, there's been so much response to that, and, and Todd Howarth and I have really been looking closely at how to do a project together, and right now, uh, this looks like the year it, it, it could happen. Uh, oh, wow. I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but Todd and I have been talking to uh, a great guitar player, a Canadian uh, lad named Sean Kelly. Oh, wow. Uh, plays with Nelly Furtado, but he's also an amazing classical player, but he is, is an absolute metal guitar player at heart. So we're probably going to uh, ask Sean to join us, and um, we... Finally, found a drummer. Oh, who? Name? We're gonna. Sorry. What's his name? Uh, Stet Howland from Wasp. Oh yeah, I know him. I know the name. Yeah. Yeah, he came through the recommendation of uh, a good friend, Danny Stanton, who's probably going to be representing us. So we're, you know, we're taking it one step at a time. But uh, I think once we get up and up and running, uh, it, it, it's going to take off quickly, and we're going to be able to get out there and do some. Comet stuff, especially the stuff that Todd was involved in. Yeah, like Something and, uh, Moved and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, some great songs. It's Over Now was always one of my favorites. Love it's, it. It's a power ballad, but... Oh, it's killer. I would love to do it live, and it looks like we may be able to make that happen in 2014. Well, I, I, if you do, you got to come up to the Bay Area and play a show, and I'd love to get just to see, meet you in person. And um, I met Todd many years ago, uh, 20 years ago, when he was playing keyboards for Cheap Trick, and he's such a wonderful guy. I mean, he sat, we were like, oh my God, it's Todd Howard, there's a couple of us Kiss fans, and he just stopped everything, and he just sat there and talked to us, and it never felt like he was just out of obligation. He was just, he was really enjoying himself. And I still talk to him occasionally on Facebook and just like you. And, you know, speaking as a Kiss fan, it really means a lot to me. And I really do, John, just the way that you reach out and you talk and, again, just doing the show, it means a lot to me. So, I, again, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I appreciate right, it. You're welcome. But the, the pleasure's mine because if it wasn't for, you know, the friends we have in music, 
uh, I wouldn't have had the opportunity over the years to do what do what I love, which is play music for a living. And, and I never ever take for granted the, the you know the name fans, but I consider them friends because uh, absolutely w- without them we can't do what we do. So thank you all. Yeah, you're very welcome, and thank you. Now let's let's talk about music. Let's get into your history of music. How old were you when you started music? What instrument was it? The bass guitar? Just a little, you know, a backstory. No, I started playing um, actually tenor saxophone in high school. Wow! And then I switched over to baritone. <laughs> I really liked this guy Jerry Mulligan, who was an amazing jazz player, baritone right. sax player. Right. And uh, I think uh, hanging out with my buddies, uh, you know, we used to get together down at the. Uh, baseball field and then somebody would bring a little too much beer and you know maybe got a little out of hand and i remember one day coming home and uh not being uh quite as sober as i should have been <laughs> and, uh, my father didn't appreciate the fact since i was living at home yeah and uh, the next day basically said go down and get that damn long hair cut off your head <laughs> so, it was in the winter and i was on my way to get my hair cut <laughs> Slipped and fell, broke my leg. Now I couldn't play bass. I mean, I couldn't play baritone sax because it's a giant chunk of metal. <laughs> yeah. So a friend of mine lent me a bass guitar. Oh, wow. And I happen to have a Young Rascals record. It's probably 1967. And I had the bass on my lap, and I'm listening to Mustang Sally on a Young Rascals album. And oh, yeah. I just started picking the notes out. And that started a, a, a lifetime love affair with bass guitar, and I never went back to the baritone sax, put it in a case, <laughs> and uh, it was off to the races with bass. Thanks, thanks for the memories, you said. The, you know, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. think you falling was a uh, coincidence. I think that was fate, my friend. I really do. I think it was Yeah, me. well, uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm a firm believer in that. So many things happen in my life, and I'm sure you can attest to this personally, but... Yeah. When you try to make things happen, it's practically impossible. When you just let let fate take a hand and it, the things occur. Well said, well said. I like it. It's a great attitude to have in life, too, because it kind of takes the pressure off a lot of things or anxieties or whatever. Yeah, bring it on. Let it all happen. That's it. <laughs> Um, now, so 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 you're playing bass. You're playing. You're learning. You're you're learning Mustang Sally. When does you know? Yeah, kind of proceed. Like, where does it go from here? Where does the first band you come in playing bass for? First band was a group called the Insights. Uh, my friend Roger Higgins was uh, was the leader of that band, and um, you know it was a local band. We used to, they had things back back in the old days. They had things <laughs> called Battle of the Bands. We oh, yeah. played you know high school dances, and it actually here in the Hudson Valley of New York. I'm about sixty miles north of Manhattan, born and raised here, and I still love it here. Awesome. Uh, there were a lot of places to work. <laughs> A lot of places to play, a lot of clubs, and it's a good place to cut your teeth. There's no better place uh, to learn a craft than to play it in front of a live audience because you get feedback real quick. <laughs> not, just, you, not just from the PA or the amps, but also from the yeah, people. Yeah, no, you get it from the audience and uh, <laughs> you know the fruit and vegetables being tossed up on the stage. <laughs> wow! That Didn't was get that bad, did it? Oh yeah! yeah. <laughs> wow! They're rough up here. Uh, it was a great place to learn, and uh, you know, you cut your teeth in front of a live audience, and when the pressure's on, that's so why I try to tell young players. But I feel for them because there aren't a lot of places to play anymore. No, and you could actually, you know, I went on to then uh, have a, a couple different bands, and you know, I was able to support a family back then in wow. the early seventies playing clubs. You could make. You know, four or five, six hundred dollars a week cash a piece, and back then that was good money. That's really good money. Now, nobody's making that money playing clubs. You know, no. that's you know, almost forty-five years on. I mean, it's like that here in the Bay Area. I mean, nobody goes to shows. Nobody goes. You know, nobody. Does, it's just it's dead. I don't know what it is. It's, but it's definitely it's it's felt across the board. I don't know if it's because of the younger generation. I don't know what it is. It's just finances. I don't know, or just people are kind of like it's kind of like mainstream television. It's like okay, I've seen this sitcom plot before. Okay, you know, I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. well, back in the sixties and seventies, think about it. What, especially, I relate it back to my high school experience. You pretty much back then, there were two ways you went. You were, you were either a music lover, or you were in a band, or you were an athlete. 
And that was about all you had to vie for your attention. We didn't have the Internet. Nope. You didn't have, uh, you know, 60-inch high-def TVs in your house to see concerts on. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. You didn't have video games. You had nothing. You basically had music or athletics. That was it. So the attention was focused on that. And, uh, you know, we had friends. We'd We'd all pool our money together. And, you know, one week, one guy uh, would buy the, the Beatles album, and then, then it was your turn the next when the Stones album came out. That's cool. We, all, we didn't have enough money to all buy our own records. <coughs> right, right. That's awesome. And then we'd sit in somebody's basement and oh. listen to this stuff coming out of the speakers that no one ever heard before. That's another thing now. Every, you know, there's only 12 notes. Yeah, in, exactly. In, in the scale. Exactly. And uh, it's kind of been done to death. Yep. Which is kind of why now, when new artists come out, they pretty much it's like the shock and awe factor instead of the music. It's, it's whatever they can do to be outlandish, to separate themselves from the rest of the the, the bunch. Like Lady but, Gaga and stuff like that. It's like look, all, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's really it's not. Like well, we're, we're, there's so much coming at you now. <laughs> Everything's coming at you at hyperspeed. <laughs> Back then, life was a lot slower. You got to. Uh, savor a record before another one came out and i'll tell you what back in the, the those days when the stones and the beatles were releasing records it was every new record was like christmas eve it was phenomenal oh i like that every new record was like christmas eve it was that's, that's the way awesome. it felt man. i was like and and again you never heard this stuff and then along no. comes cream and hendrix and that just blew the roof off it and zeppelin uh that's where we all got our love you know th- you saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. It's like, I, you know, I want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it fair to say that Paul McCartney is definitely one of your influences on the bass? Absolutely. I, I don't think any any modern-day bass player can deny that. And no. McCartney, Bill Wyman. Bill Wyman is such an underrated bass player Absolutely. on the Stone stuff. Absolutely. I mean, his choice of passing notes. You know, if you're a bass player and you really listen... He doesn't repeat a part. That's so difficult to do. When you Especially then, they were cutting those records live. It wasn't copy and pasted or you know like they do now. It's like this. This is the, you go through it. You run. A, you do a run through. Maybe they might cut the tape, but it's oh, really, yeah. But other yeah. than that, it's like wow. So um, when you when you so you you so we're you're playing at banjo. You're playing the cover. You're doing the cover scene. I'm trying to find that. I mean, because you have an amazing resume. I mean, you know, when I told people, who's oh, your guest? Thank you. I mean, come on. Not many people can say, you know, Freely, Frampton, Stones, Stephen Stills, uh, Bill Reddle, David Lee Roth. Come on, John. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty dang impressive. How did you go? How did you go from doing that into... Um, actually, quick question here. I'm, I'm kind of going back. Were you with... Um, you played on Eugene, right? The uh, 79... Well, that's, that's kind of where the whole thing started. You with Eugene. nail on the head. What, what, what had happened was I had a band here uh, up, up in the Hudson Valley. It's called Easy Street. And we were playing a lot of clubs. It was great players in that band. Uh, I, actually, I remember, oddly enough, you can remember moments, little <laughs> moments of enlightenment. Right. Uh, the first one was going with a friend of mine to see Mountain. Oh, yeah, Leslie uh, West, and yeah. The original Mountain with Popolardi on bass, Steve Knight was on keyboards, and wow. sitting in that theater and just getting this feeling that came over you, like your hair on the back of your neck, and I was like, I want to do this. You know? Right, right, Not right. Not thinking you would ever do it, but, right. you know, that was one night. And then being in Easy Street in this band, we, we played a lot. Uh, we played a lot of varied material, but I remember we used to rehearse after we play out on a weekend so we'd finish playing at two in the morning and then we'd be rehearsing stuff for next week's shows wow. and i remember earn, learning uh, earth wind and fire that's the way of the world oh yeah a groove that just oh. it's still some of my favorite stuff to listen to and uh it was three in the morning and we're learning that song and something just hit me and it's like i want to do this for the rest of my life i want to oh, play wow. music i can remember it like it was yesterday and it was probably maybe 1974 or 5 or 6, I, I don't know, or right in that era. Wow. And I just, just got this, this like electric feeling when I was playing this. I, I want, I, the feeling I'm getting playing this song, okay. I want to have for the rest of my life. And I think that's what keeps a lot of us doing it, because there's, a, there's certain nights, whether it was in a club 
or whether you're on an open mic or whether you're playing in front of 50,000 people, there'll be certain times, and I can count them on one hand over a 40-year period, uh, that you get a feeling when everything is clicking that money can't buy. I don't care if you have the amount of money that Donald Trump has or Warren Buffett. You can't buy that feeling. It has to happen. And I can't explain it, but there'll be players out there, there'll be people listening to this that'll know exactly what I'm talking oh, about. Absolutely. And that's what keeps you doing it through the hardship, you know, because you want it, that feeling again. And when it happens, it's just, it's, it's magical. It's an amazing feeling. So anyway, we've got this club band, and we're playing out. We're successful around here. Right. And um, I get a call uh, from a friend of mine, uh, Joe Renda, Crazy this, Joe. This is Crazy Eugene. Joe. Okay, yeah. And, and yeah, a variable he, uh, speed band. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had worked on the first record I ever recorded was Chip Taylor's album in 1971, and Joe was the musical director, great keyboard player, uh, and and turned has turned into a lifelong friend. Uh, Did Chip, Chip had written Chip Chip's John said, Boyd's brother, oh, Angel of the Morning, Wild Thing? That's wow, Chip wow. This was yeah, this was a country record because Chip also had written a lot of hits for uh, uh, Waylon Jennings and those kind of guys. Uh, so he was, he was a country writer from Yonkers. It was pretty interesting. Uh, so that's how I met Joe Renda. So he now, eventually, in the uh, late 70s, opens up a studio, a recording studio in White Plains, along with Chip Taylor. Mm -hmm. And John Voigt was a partner. And this guy, uh, Ernie Rivellino and Alan Vinson. They, they, a consortium built the studio. Right. So I find out that he's got a studio, so I start going out and hanging out because I want as much experience as I can get when that red light goes on. Right, right, right. Uh, now I'm playing clubs. I'm getting up, and I go down to Joe, and, and I said, Joe, I, I'll play on anything, anybody for free. I need the experience. I <laughs> want the experience. Wow. So simultaneously, he decides we're going to do like a once a, a weekly card game, like a weekly poker game, only we're going to go down there and record pretty much the goofiest stuff we can think of, which ended up becoming <laughs> Crazy Joe and a variable speed band. We never in a million years thought that was going to ever see the light of day as a record. Right, right. We were just getting together, goofing off. Right. Uh, you know, and there again, you can't, you cannot try to make things happen. They have to happen on their own. So, like you were saying earlier, short, yeah. Yeah, it becomes Eugene, and, and the record actually got a huge amount of play, especially in the, in the Massachusetts and New England area. You know what's funny so, is because I grew up <clears throat> I grew up in Massachusetts, and to this day, besides <clears throat> excuse me, Kiss fans, a lot of people are like, do you remember that song in 1979, Eugene? And people are like, no. I'm like, oh, oh, it's such a great song. And that's interesting because that's where I grew up, and I remember that song on the radio just being like, this is the coolest song ever. Yeah, what, wasn't <laughs> it? Was it WBLS? What was the big Boston station there? Oh, I don't remember back then. It was um, yeah, but yeah. they. I mean, they they went crazy on it. it and huge. of course, Ace had something to do with the writing and production of that. I think basically he he wrote the word Eugene and played <laughs> and played syndrome. And here he's like he's going like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's Ace. So Ace isn't that's doing Ace play that. That was his contribution to the record. So he's not doing that guitar riff because it almost sounds very Ace-like. The guitar. No, riff, he's no. not doing. He's not doing a guitar riff. That was just a bunch of us guy. That was Eddie Monteleone and John Platania, who at the time was playing uh, playing with Van Morrison. Oh wow! Uh, and has still plays with Van Morrison, I think. But wow! So, so we we make this record. I'm going down there working on anything I can work on. Uh, my club band is working up here. A friend of mine, Frankie Previtt, who I was in a band called Bull Angus, was on Mercury Records. Frankie says, I've got a bunch of songs, but I want to cut some demos. So I said, well, I said, it's you and a guitar player. I said, but I've got like a full band, so why don't you come up here? So we rehearsed these songs. That ends up becoming... Frankie and the Knockouts. I don't know if you heard. Remember I, that band? I remember they, the name. What was they had a minor hit? They had a right? song called Sweetheart. It was a bit. It was number one, I think, and it was a big hit. Right. So right. We cut those demos. At the same time, he's shopping those demos. I get a call from Joe Renda, Crazy Joe. He goes, "Listen, uh, Bobby Mayo lives near here, 
and Frampton needs a bass player. Oh, wow. I said, get out of here. Said, get, <laughs> what are you talking about? Said, Peter Frampton, come on. Yeah. And this was 1979, so he was still like... Huge. Yeah. He had just come out with um, I'm In You, probably, right around that I'm time. I'm In You, yeah. So I said, get out of here. He goes, no, <laughs> seriously. This was a Tuesday night. Yeah. So he said, drive down. So I'm about an hour from White Plains. I jump in my car, I go down, and I meet Bobby Mayo. Uh, and he hands me a pile of records, because back then, yeah. that's all we had. Exactly. <laughs> was Absolutely. Records. Absolutely. And it was like a two-hour show. He, he, he gives me a list, and he goes, learn this stuff. you got to play on Friday. That's wow. Tuesday night. Wow. So I drive home, and I, I tell my wife, put the pot of coffee on, because I'm staying up. <laughs> yeah. And I did. I stayed, up for, I stayed up for two days learning that music. Because uh, I actually was not a Frampton fan of his, uh, even though it, I think it was required by law that everyone owned Frampton comes, comes alive. alive I yes, didn't, I didn't. I was a scoff law. I didn't own it. I was, I was into like, I was in the heavier stuff. I was more of a fan of his humble pie stuff with Steve Marriott. Yeah, before pre pre solo career. Yes, uh, absolutely. So anyway, I learned it, and, and uh, <laughs> there I go off on the road for the first time in my life. It's, it's, this kid was playing club bands. Now, now I'm playing in front of tens of thousands of people with Peter Frampton in a, in a matter of seventy-two hours. So. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, I mean, you really did. T- and, and we're not. And again, this is seventy-nine, eighty. Frampton still was huge then. I mean, he's still. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> so did you play on the? Um, he had a he had a comeback single in eighty-five. Um, I remember the video on MTV. Oh gosh, what was the name of it? Did you play on that on the on the albums in the eighties too? I played on uh, the first album I did was uh, called Breaking All the Rules. Right, right. It was in that would have been nineteen eighty. Then we did uh, a record called The Art of Control, maybe eighty one, eighty two. Yeah. And then eighty three, he pretty much he lost the record deal with uh, with A and M. Right. And uh, he just stopped. So. <clears throat> Pardon me. Yeah. That's when I started working with other people. You know, started working with um, with Ace, actually. So how did that come to? So basically, I mean, of course, Eugene, and I'm going to post that on the Bob's Radio Cafeteria. If people do not know this song, I mean, I honestly, I love that song. I, th- I think the chorus is killer. And just it's crazy. Re- it's crazy stuff. And there's a video on that. Oh, there is. I'm going to post that. I'm going to post that real quick on that. Who does the voice of Eugene? Is that is that Joe? That's that's Joe. Yeah. It is Joe. Okay. okay. Now, now the video. He goes. He says, "Look, uh, we need to do a video." Yeah. And now, keep in mind, we did this album for nothing, basically. Right, 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 right. Because it wasn't supposed to be an album. Great cover, by the way. <laughs> the oh cover. yeah, thank you. This is, we got to do a video. So I need a real dog. I said, boy, do I have a place? It's like three blocks from my house. It's called the Box Seat Pub. Oh my lord. So, so we go in there. The, our entire video budget, and this is the God's <clears> honest truth. It was fifty dollars. Oh my god! There's a couple friends with cameras, and most of the fifty dollars was pizza and beer. Oh, that's awesome! That's so and it ended up on a show called Rockline or Rock World, and our video premiered right in front of Paul McCartney's video. Oh, <laughs> it probably cost about a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> yeah, Ours was fifty bucks. <laughs> that's awesome. So, so with working with Peter, so then of course Eugene, uh, you know Crazy Joe, then Peter Frampton. Now this opens the doors. Is this where the doors? This is where you get working, not just with Ace, but with John Waite, The Stones, Stephen Stills, Trower, you know, yeah. Scandal, yeah. Billy Idol. David Lee Roth. Is that when the doors just started just flying open? Well, ha- having you know, having the name uh, and having worked with Peter Frampton on the resume opened uh, tons of doors. Obviously, absolutely. Uh, you know, then um, I, you know, as simultaneously as we're doing the the, the uh, Crazy Joe record, we're in. Uh, I'm, I met Ace for the first time at, at Joe's studio, North Lake Sound in White Plains. That's where you first met him. Okay. Well, I believe I didn't know who he was. I believe I just stepped over him because he was horizontal on the floor <laughs> yes. at the time. Yes. So, so I really, I said, who's that? And I go, oh, yeah, that's Ace Frehley. I thought it's nice. You know, the guy who kiss? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, when he wakes up, I'll talk to him <laughs> and see if I can get his autograph. You know? So how did, how did you get, so, so when, Ace, when Ace was putting together, because I remember in Hit Parader back before the first album came out in 87, there was a bunch of shows, he did like a couple of shows, and it was like people were kind of like, wow, they're so keyboard heavy, it's so synthesizer heavy, now those demos are out there, but um, this is when it was like you, Richie Scarlett, Ace Frehley, and Anton, right, Anton Fig. Yeah, well, from being in Frampton's band, I met Arthur Stead. 
Now, mm-hmm. Arthur Stead took Bobby Mayo's place in the band. Arthur played keys, guitar, and sang. Got it. So, uh, when Peter stopped touring, Arthur was in Franklin's band with me at the time. Mm-hmm. So Ace had left Kiss. We're talking now we're in the 83, 84 range. Yep, yep, right? yep, yep. 85. And I, I probably ran into Ace at uh, Joe's studio, North Lake. Right. And we were both not doing anything. So he had his house in Wilton, Connecticut with a, f- a phenomenal studio. Ace and we were just talking or... about. Yeah, we're talking about <laughs> what really. We, we're kind of both a little disenchanted with the business end of the business because now Peter wasn't working. It's like. We wanted to get back to why we decided to start playing music. Oh, wow. So we started talking about, oh, I remember Hendrix and the, you know, the Stones and yeah. Zeppelin. So he invited me up because why don't you come up and jam? I, you know, I'll, I got my friend Anton Figo come up. And so that's the first time I met Anton. So the three of us started putting together. We just started jamming up at Ace's house. That's and this is when Anton. This is when Anton came. He just started working. He was David Letterman's drummer then. Just this is before Letterman. This, this is, is prior to Letterman. This is we're, again we're we're back eighty three, eighty four, eighty five. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, so now we're just jamming at Ace's house, and it's like this is just for fun because you know, yeah. no, nothing involved, and it, it started to gel into like well, it may, maybe this could be a band. Yeah. So to flesh it out, we brought in Richie Scarlett, and I said, well, I've just been working with Arthur. Let's bring Arthur in. For keyboards, yeah. For keyboards. So yeah. that's how the original Fraley's Comet thing started. And we recorded with <clears throat> Vinnie Poncia, and they, you, there's some of those, like you said. Uh, they're out there, yeah. They're out there. I got the touch. and uh, Girl Can't Dance. and Girl Can't Dance. Some great stuff. I, it was I like kind it. Of wacky. Wacky no, stuff. I like uh, it. But, I like it. Uh, a lot of people seem to to want to hear it. I wish we could find a, the actual two inch tape and play it, and it up a little bit. But now, what, when did the name come? Did, did do you remember the day that Ace came and said, "Hey, I got the name for Ellie's Comet"? You know, was it was it? I he, don't remember. I wish I could remember that. I really don't. Yeah, obviously <coughs> it's a play on Haley's Comet, but uh, yeah, of course, be, if Ace being the space Ace uh, from outer space. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I think he is. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. It, it, it worked, and we had a great time, and we had a record deal with a, a label Atlantic. in England uh, for that first incarnation of the band. Oh, oh, oh. And oh. then we're getting ready to record 1985, and the label goes out of business. Oh. It's like, oh, great, all that work down the tube. So at that point, <laughs> it's like, now what? So everybody goes their separate ways. Anton starts doing what Anton's doing. Yep. Uh, I end up uh, working with John Waite. Oh, sweet! And at that point, and and this uh, is right. So this is right when he's huge. I mean, this is you know missing you and all that. Yeah, stuff. It, was, it was wonderful. Actually, uh, I put the cart before the horse. Anton and I were in scandal for a little bit. Okay, is this, is this is this is this post? Um, is this post Warrior or is this pre Warrior or is, when, when right we, after Warrior? Okay, uh, Patty was uh, looking for players and. Oh. Uh, Again, from working with Anton, uh, with Ace, Anton called me. I went down and auditioned, uh, and it was just it, we just did like one tour of Japan, I think, and some shows in the United States. And then at the time, Patty was like eight months pregnant. Oh, with John McEnroe? So, is that John McEnroe's kid? Or no, this is with uh, this is with oh, what was his name? Richard Hell. Oh, from the vo- the the, the punk rock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yes, she was pregnant with a uh, the hell baby, and, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yeah, there you go. So, all, all, of course, she goes off and has a baby. That's the end of that. So, but we had been over in Japan, and John Wade had, was over there at the same time. Mm-hmm. So we kind of hooked up, you know, uh, through Frankie LaRocca. Uh, he was working at Atlantic Records while he was working with John. And we ended up uh, just becoming friends. And at one point, John needed a bass player. So I uh, I went down to an audition. I got the gig. Nice. And uh, spent a couple of years in John's band. And you were playing so we there did, at the height of his... We did a record called Rover's Return, which was really a good record. But then again, it has the same situation. <clears throat> he was on EMI, I think. I think it was EMI. And yeah, the label yeah. folded right as uh, as that record came out. Oh. That's, that's always a kiss of death. <laughs> there's all the promotion. There's everything just down the toilet. Everything just stops. It all stops. And then he and eventually it's, it's, went it's on It's actually to... a very good record <clears throat> if anybody wants to get a chance to look it up. It's called Rover's Return. going to look that up on YouTube tonight. I love it. 
Uh, I saw him yeah, once. Some great stuff on there. He's just great a gr- very underrated singer. Just really underrated. Just an amazing. I yeah. think I just love his stuff with the babies. I love his solo stuff. So okay, so John, you're touring with John Waite. Then, right. then Frilly's Comet. Now, now, now we're getting about eighty-seven. This is when now we're, Megaforce. Yeah. Now, now Megaforce comes in to Frilly's Comet and says, "Hey." We want to sign you. What, what's, what was that? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. I get a call, uh, from, uh, I think, from Eddie Kramer. Oh, and wow. And he said, Ace got a deal. And I said, fantastic. Well, let's put the band together. Let's do it. Well, <coughs> Arthur was playing with, uh, oh, my God. I think he was playing with Public Enemy or some, some wacko band. Uh, so he was busy. Richie was doing his own solo thing. So basically, we went in as a trio, which is how the whole thing started in the first place. Absolutely. <laughs> Playing Hendrix songs and Zeppelin songs. So it's you, Anton, and Ace get that's, back together. That's, yeah, we, got, we get in the studio with Eddie Kramer. Oh, my Johnny God. Johnny Z, Johnny and Marsha, and Eddie Trunk. Very imp- Eddie Trunk, I think, really championed the cause. Yeah. Uh, if, if we owe anyone a debt of gratitude, it's Eddie Trunk for... He convinced Johnny and Marsha to sign Ace because right. you know there's a lot of they they were a little unsure and Eddie vouched for him and, and at the time Ace was you know straight up sober doing an amazing job we had a great time he was focused he was really really Abs- focused oh absolutely focused totally focused uh, so we went <laughs> in we cut most of it the record and uh, I remember at one point thinking well maybe we need you know, another singer. Now, while I was touring with John Waite, we did a co-headline tour with Cheap Trick. Which, at the time, had Todd Howarth doing the studio. I mean, Todd Howarth was an sta- offstage keyboard player. Offstage, right. Who was playing his butt off. And He's an amazing musician. Singing yeah. notes that Robin couldn't hit on night. <laughs> and we, be- we became friends, because Todd just, a, a, he and I are kindred spirits. We we have a lot of the same yeah, significant yeah. beliefs. That, so, I I always you know I put his name right in the phone book if I ever need anybody because here's a guitar player yes. keyboard player singer songwriter you, and a hell of a nice guy you got everything and right. a hell of a nice guy yeah and uh, I, I definitely uh, the girls always uh, enjoyed him as well <laughs> exactly <laughs> in 1987 if you had a good looking guy with long blonde hair that can has to, <laughs> your guys are, you and Ace are like. That's our guy. <laughs> so, 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 you, so she brought him to I, Ace. I brought it up to Ace. Yeah, I brought it up to Ace, and and Todd came in, and we played together. <laughs> he played him some of the songs, which is, you know, something moved and uh, trying to remember. I don't have the album in front of me. That, that uh, first something show. moved. Um, well, no breakout. He already had with Eric Carr, but well, then he well, breakout. Yeah, yeah, that was because that a was lot was of those songs that Todd brought in. There's the earlier demos of his earlier band doing those songs, like something yeah, moved. Seven oh seven. Yep. Seven oh seven. Yep. Oh, and um, um, oh, the song I really love. From, you. I, I mean, love that stuff. song. Love that song. Oh, Thank that's you. a good one. Great song. That's a so killer. We, so we we finished the record with Todd, and now we are a quartet, <laughs> and that that's the album, and that's the band that was Fraley's Comet. And the uh, album did well. The album did the album. I remember the single, the first single, "Into the Night," which was filmed here in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Yay! Uh, I remember that oh. night well. I see. I have to tell you. I I meant to tell you earlier. It's funny. Someone just sent me a Facebook message coming from Europe and said, oh, you know, I'm coming to America. You tell me which cities, what, you know, what's oh, wow. one, your, one of your, your favorite cities? First one up was San Francisco. Right I on, John. Love, I love it out there. I really do. Was it cold uh, that night? Because you, you guys look like you were oh, freezing. <laughs> it was like three, and well, we had to do it. At, I think we, our call was at midnight. Wow. I think we were filming it around three because we couldn't do it with traffic. No, of course yeah. not. No, no. Uh, it was it was very cold. Because um, so there's a scene where you guys are walking down. There. There's a scene well, where you guys are walking down. Video, the, yeah. Go ahead. So, I was just saying, say, there's a scene where you guys are walking down the street, and it's like you could tell you guys are freezing. So continue, yeah. continue. So I just to back up a little, if, if you, you seem like you really got this chronologically down. I don't want to leave anything out. Absolutely not. Right after we recorded uh, the Fraley's Comet record, Anton got a gig with Letterman. That's when he be, and, and he's still, still to this day, and, he's playing with. Yeah, Letterman. and the way he got the gig with Letterman, this is how it's such a small business. Peter Frampton then was sitting in with the Letterman band one night. Okay. Now Peter knew Anton because we had worked, we had done stuff together for Peter's records. 
with Anton. Mm-hmm. So I'd suggested Anton. Yeah, amazing so, drummer, amazing drummer. Uh, inc- incredible drummer. Jesus. So he, he, he gets, Peter gets the call of the Letterman, and Steve Jordan was a drummer at the time. Right, the original drummer was Steve Jordan, another amazing, the, he was the oh, Blues yeah. Brothers, he was the original Blues Brothers drummer too, he's on the, the briefcase full of blues, and amazing yeah. drummer. Yeah. Amazing drummer. Anyways. So they're doing the run through now. Letterman goes to tape, I think, at five thirty in the afternoon. They're, they're doing and uh, their sound check with the band and doing the run through for the songs. And Steve Jordan is not there. He didn't show up. Oh, whatever. Who knows why? But we don't know. So they're getting to literally, and I've been, I've heard Peter tell this story multiple times. They're getting to, they're getting the show time, and there's no drummer. Oh my God! So they're like fifteen minutes away, and and. Paul Schaefer's freaking out. And, I can imagine. And, and, and Peter says, well, I know this guy, Anton Fig. He lives just up on Central Park West. So they somehow they put a call into Anton, and according to Peter, Anton gets to the studio, brings a snare drum, puts a snare drum on the stand, and then literally in 10 seconds they count in the theme song. And Anton was a drummer from that point on. I believe it. I honestly, I you know, I believe it because you know, the, the, as we both, I mean, I don't know the man personally, but from watching his performances, you know him personally. He's an incredible drummer. I mean, this guy can play anything. He's just he's yeah. he's one of those guys that I look as like he's one of the most underrated drummers. He's just he's amazing drummer. I can he imagine. Is, I would done a lot of records with him, a lot of different records. We did a Michael Monroe record together. Uh, from uh, Hanoi many, Rocks. Many records. Oh, Hanoi. Oh, Hanoi, the Hanoi Rocks, Michael Monroe. Yeah, phenomenal. Oh. Great. He was great. That is that was the a record? Wonderful record. Is that the record that came out in 8990 and like Axl Rose is on it and all that? Is yeah. It? Yep. Oh, well, you... not faking it. Yeah, not Texas faking it. The first single was Dead Jail or Rock and Roll. Right, and that's uh, Axel's and the Axl Rose from Guns N' Roses is in that video. Yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I didn't see. That's now that's a thing. That's that. I didn't see him listed. On your Wikipedia page, he was not listed. That's so. Whoever does the, Wiki- See, I, I don't know who does the Wikipedia page. I don't. For some reason, at one time they had that I work with Cindy Lauper, and that was a complete uh, fabrication. Not, <laughs> yeah, not that I wouldn't have minded it. Back no, then, of course. The, uh, I don't know who does the Wikipedia page, or maybe I better look at it. Well, there was the something. Best pl- th- the best place is Facebook. Yep. Uh, and just ask you directly. Let's just do that. John, did you you <laughs> John is very accessible on Facebook. He's a hell of a nice guy, as you can tell. We are on Bob's Radio Cafeteria. And if you have any questions for John, please go to the Facebook page, facebook.com slash Bob's Radio Cafeteria. Ask any question you want about any part of this man's amazing history. We still got another half an hour to go, um, and we've only <laughs> only touched half of it. As I said to uh, to Robert Fleischman last week, I said, "You know what? You need a part two, my friend." He says, "Okay." So, John, just to put it out there, there may have to be a part two at, down the line because you again, just an amazing these stories. It's like I want to get everything in there, and then it's like finally you just got to go. Well, you just got to go with it, and what comes out comes out. Um, so you put any time you want that. We can do part two, three, four, five, whatever you oh, like. Oh, John, thank <laughs> we you. We can talk about what I'm going to plant in my garden this spring <laughs> when we get to that point. I'm Actually, up. that's my question. What are you going to plant in your garden this spring? This you probably uh, right. You know, there's a funny story. You're going to jump ahead to uh, getting a call to play on. Uh, on the Dirty Work album. Oh, for the Rolling Stones. I definitely wanted to get into that. Well, I'll just give you a quick snippet. Uh, here I, I I, get a call to go and uh, meet Mick Jagger at his house. Oh he wants God. to play me this stuff, right? So I, I'm pinching myself thinking I'm going to wake up for this at any time. But anyway, getting to the garden aspect of it. We get in his limo and we're riding from his house on West End Avenue down to the studio on 48th Street. And we start talking about <laughs> tomato plants. Now, the difference is, he's got a garden in the south of France somewhere, and I've got a garden in, uh, you know... Upstate, upstate New, York. New York. Yeah, 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 yeah. We were th- but that was our conversation. And as we're having a conversation, I'm going, I'm talking to Mick Jagger about <laughs> exactly. tomato plants. I mean, it really was, so this really was a moment you went... God, I'm just this guy from upstate New York, and I'm in a limo with the one and only Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. I mean, how cool yeah. is that? But we're talking about the most basic thing, which proves Tomatoes. that we're all the same. We're all the same. <laughs> so you played on Dirty Work. That's interesting. Now, tell, tell, the, uh, tell the audience about that. What, how, how did that come involved? Obviously, you met Mick. What track did you play on, or tracks, I should say, well, I met, why? I met Mick. Uh, through Nile Rodgers, who is oh, God. probably my favorite producer of all time. He's fantastic. And, uh, he was 
I got a call from uh, from Nile. For people don't know Nile Rogers. He played with the the band Chic. He's also produced so many Madonna. He's done so much. Bowie, he, yeah, that Bowie. The Let's Dance album, yeah. uh, Duran Duran, Power Station, just just an amazing talent, amazing across Un- unreal. the board. Uh, so you get a call. And, uh, he needed a bass part replaced. I, I, you remember when Jagger and Bowie did Dancing in the Streets for Live Aid? Yes, that I was do. their contribution. Well, they weren't <laughs> happy with the bass on there. So I got called in to replace the bass part. Wow. I, you know, I, I, like, I just flew, I, I got on the train, I got into the city. There's Nile Rogers, oh, um, and I'm getting ready to replace this bass part, right? Wow. And in, in walks Jagger. Oh, my God. And now I'm like, this, you know, I, this can't be real. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm going to wake up at any moment now, and I'm going to have to yeah. take the garbage I'm out. little Johnny oh, Reagan from, from upstate New York. What the yeah. hell is going on? <laughs> so there, you know, he, he, he put, puts the track up. I'm replacing the bass in the control room, and I just crank it as loud as you can. I want it to feel like we're on stage. So I'm... I'm putting the bass down. I'm catching a glimpse in my peripheral vision of Mick dancing around behind me like oh, like a joyous child. Wow. And I'm, now, this is one of the few things that I did in one take. It, I would have preferred to be there all day, but for some reason, I just, I was concentrating. It was one take. However long the song is, however, is however long I was in that room with those guys. Give or take a few minutes in the front end and the back end. But... While I'm playing this and I'm recording it, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm watching Mick, and I'm going, "That's why he is who he is." Oh, absolutely! This man loves music. It's not about the rock star part. He, he's a musician. Yeah. He's a. That's it. That's the core. The core is music. You know. So anyway, we do that. Uh, they ended up using it, so I was over the moon about that. So now here we are again. I'm working on somebody's record at Northlake with Joe Renda. Back, it's the luckiest, luckiest place on the planet for me is, is that studio. You and, and Joe Renda, it's like a magic studio for you well, two. I owe everything to him, and I, I'll tell anybody, and I have told a lot of people. I owe my whole career to him having the faith to recommend me to Bobby. He had more faith in me than I had in myself. So, wow. Uh, I owe it to him. So anyway, I'm doing a record there, and people have been busting my chops about. Oh, Big Shot now, play with Mick Jagger. <laughs> yeah, I David Bowie, yeah. You know, so I... A call comes through. I'm downstairs in the studio. It comes through and says, there's a call for John. It, it says it's Mick Jagger. I said, oh, I said, yeah. Yeah. I said who's this? Who's this, is this Joe? Is this Joe? I'm just kidding. Work. Yeah. And, you know, and so I picked the phone up, and I'm ready to like read somebody to riot act for yeah, interrupting yeah. me while I'm working. Yeah. And it sounded like Jagger. And it was. And oh, he asked God. me to come down and play. I didn't know what it was. He goes, you know, want, want you to come down and try to put a couple of bass parts down. So. And what song? Because okay, I have a couple of questions. I got a, from a Bill Wang. He wants to know: Was it Harlem Shuffle? Was it One Hit to the Body? It, it was. All right. Here's so. Here's what happens. I I get the call. Mick says, "Come to my house." I go to his house. You know, at the time he was married to Jerry Hall, and yeah, of I course. go up. I go up to his house, and the <clears> doorman <throat> lets me in, and, <laughs> and I'm in Mick Jagger's living room. Yeah, yeah. What the hell is going on here? It is <laughs> bizarre world, bizarre stuff. So Jerry comes in and says hello, oh and Mick God. goes, ah, i got to go take a shower. This is what I want you to play on. So he puts on <coughs> Winning Ugly, which is one of the tracks on the record, right? That you played on. So I chart, out, I chart it out. I'm scribbling it down, So we, and we get in the car. And on our way, we're talking about the tomato plants. This we is get the tomato the pants. Okay, yeah. It's probably 10 o'clock at night. We're at right track on 48th Street in Manhattan, which you had to take an elevator up to. So we get up there, and we're, we're recording. And um, I remember we did, we finished Winning Ugly, and then we started on One Hit to the Body. And I just, what I did is I replaced a little middle section on that, what kind of breaks down. Okay, yep, yep. And then um, Steve Lillywhite was the producer, and he goes, well, why don't we go to the top and, and, and uh, why don't you, you know, just do a run through. Down, do a run, do a do run. A run, put some bass down on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Now keep in mind, before we did Winning Ugly, he plays me, he goes, well, here's what Bill played, Wyman, and I'm listening, going, oh, shit, that's amazing. And he goes, and here's what Ronnie Wood played, because he was an incredible bass player. Oh, absolutely. One of my idols when he was with Jeff Beck. So, and I'm going, oh, oh this is, God. How, how am I going to do And he goes, and here's what Keith played, because they, they all will put parts on records. You know? Right, right, Whoever, right. 
So, and he goes, okay, now you have a turn. And I'm, that, talk about the intimidation level being at about a million. You know? let's, let's, put this, let's put this in perspective here. It's like, here's Bill Wyman, yeah. here's Keith Richards, here's Ronnie Wood, and now here's our friend John, who's about to play. Yeah, and I'm going, yeah, right, okay, good <laughs> yeah. luck, pal. So anyway, I just probably made That's the sign awesome. across and just went for it. And they, they liked it. So And then now we, we start on uh, one hit to the body, yeah. and a phone call comes through. It's probably about midnight now. And the phone call is from Keith. Uh, Mick had people keeping an eye on Keith, and Keith had people keeping an eye on Mick because they were feuding back then. I remember that was like and that was a time they just did not. They despised each other. They not were... at all. So, so the phone call comes through, and <laughs> I see. I think it was Steve Lily White who probably turned Lily White when what he heard. He goes, the message was. Keith's on his way. He's been drinking. He's got a gun. He's on his way to the studio. Oh this so is like a Phil Spector moment. What's oh, the yeah. They shut down this session so fast, and we literally went out the back door of the studio, oh and that was God. the end of my my uh, my playing on that record. But I, I did end up on, on all of uh, Winning Ugly and in just a little bit of one hit to the body. Uh, did you did you get a, did you get a platinum record for that? Do you did you? I did a gold oh. record and a platinum record. Oh yeah. wow! So now 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 your resume is just like okay now you're you're like okay I played with Frampton I played with John Waite I played with Ace you know now I've got I, well, this all the uh, dirty work is just before the Frilly's Comet stuff so you continue now I want to know is where does where does Stephen Stills is just a, is just just another like somebody calls you up and says you know Stephen Stills needs you for this or you know Billy Idol David Lee Roth is that just people would call you up and say we need you for this and that well see Cap to keep in mind back then there was a very very vibrant recording scene in New York which is sadly long gone you know, because everybody makes records now on their iPad. Yeah, right. It's pretty, you know. Right, right, right. So you could re you could be rehearsing at SIR <laughs> or recording at one of the studios, and there'd always be somebody that you knew there. It was a very, it was a very small business, believe it or not. I and, believe uh, it. I believe it. And and you know, be like, hey, I'm I'm working on uh, this record next month. Are you interested? And I said, yeah, I'm interested. Sure. So the Stephen Stills thing happened where. The Fraley's Comet thing had pretty much run its course. So keep in mind, we just skipped over second sighting and trouble walking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, That's going to be good. We're, we're, we're going to 1990, you know, yeah, yeah. and it, it had just got a little bit out of control for my liking. I've heard so the stories. Deal. That could be another yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. My deal with Johnny Z was as long as it's straight up and yeah. uh, everybody's, <laughs> you know, trying to do the right thing, I'm um, there 110%. I want to ask but you real quick, before you go to Stephen Stills real fast, one, um, uh, Brian, a.k.a. Legion, a DJ here, he's, he sent me a message. Did you did, did Ace ever give you any details about leaving Kiss, or he, you guys never talked about it? No, he just uh, he, he just kind of felt that it was time uh, to, to branch out and do his own thing. You and, you know, there was never like a big discussion about, uh, you know, I feel like I can't do this. Or I can't. He just felt... I, you know, they, look, he had the most success with New York Groove and all the solo albums. Yeah, of course. And I course. think he just wanted to do his own uh, his own project. God bless him, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. I, 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 so Stephen I, Stills. You know, so, so what happened was I, <coughs> summer of 1990, I pretty much had it. You're done with Ace. You're done with the whole yeah. trouble uh, walking. It, just wasn't, it wasn't going. I love the record. I thought we it's did a great, did record. great job on that record. I thought Ace did a great job. Oh, absolutely. It. Um, you know, I really, I really like what Richie brought, the edge he brought to that record. Yeah. Uh, I had suggested Do Ya, which he really, Ace fought me on, but I just had a feeling he could pull it off, and I thought he did a great job. Which it. was released as a single. That was the actual yeah. single yeah. that was released in the video on MTV, yeah. That yeah. guy's did a killer so, version of that. Anyways. Yeah, thanks. I liked it. So, so anyway, but the tour and everything, it just, it wasn't working anymore yeah. for me. Uh, so I left. And um, a British drum, a, a British drummer friend of mine, Tony Beard. Um, he was in a band called Go West, and I've been doing some various sessions. Again, you know, in your time off, it may sound like you're busy playing with this one and this one, but you you only might tour for two, three, four months a year, and there's a lot of downtime. Right. So he ended up getting called to do different sessions. So I'd worked on a session or two with Tony Beard, and he was playing with Stephen Stills. <laughs> And basically, it was a blues quartet with Tony, uh, Stephen, uh, probably the best Hammond B3 player on the planet, Mike Finnegan, 
Uh, Mike Finnegan played on uh, some Hendrix stuff. Wow. He wrote his name up. And I he's played with Etta James, and uh, wow. Ed Finnegan is just, he's the real deal. Great blues singer, incredible B3 player. And here you are again he, sitting in a room with this guy and Stephen Stills from Crosby, Stills, Nash, and you're sitting yeah, here. Yeah, I'm learning Stills' stuff in my same room that I learned Frampton stuff in going, <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to get to play Love the One You're With <laughs> so with this awesome. guy. And, and, you know, and the guy that wrote probably, to me, one of the best lines of, in the history of music uh, it's getting to the point where I'm no fun anymore from Street Judy Blue Eyes. I mean, we've Great all been lyric. there, you know? Great lyric. And, uh, so uh, working with him was just <clears throat> an, another thrill of a lifetime. What was he and like? And I did that for a couple He's phenomenal. Just yeah. one of the coolest guys that laid back. We both shared a passion for golf. So uh, <laughs> what I liked about touring with Stephen was the gig was usually an inconvenience to the, to the round of golf, you know? We'd have yeah. to rush back to do sound check. <laughs> sounds like you should, you should start touring with Alice Cooper. It seems like... We I don't, believe me, I try. <laughs> I try for years, exactly. Because a friend of mine, Damon Johnson, uh, played with Alice for a while, and I used to play golf with Damon on the road. Right, right, right. Because he was in John Waite's band for a while, and when Waite was opening for us with Frampton, it's... it's small just, world. It's, it's a small play. world. It's a very incestuous uh, situation <laughs> with all this music. It, but it's interesting. It really is interesting to show you how... You know, yes, it is right time at right moment. You know, it is luck of the thing. But still, once you get your foot in, and especially back then, it was just all lined up. It's like, well, I know John, he can do it. And are you are like, you know, Peter saying, here's Anton. Anton can get over here and play the gig, you know, so on and yeah. so on. That's how it happens. Oddly enough, over the years, especially with Frampton, we went through a lot of lineup changes. And, you know, everybody thinks there's this, this you know, what is a secret network or how guys, get, yeah. you know, how do you find guys? Well, you know how you find them? You sit there one morning and go, oh, man, we need a keyboard player. You, got, you know anybody? That's about how technical it is. I and believe it's it. Like, you rack your brain to try to think some, find somebody who is not only a great player, but this is another thing I tell young, young musicians. I don't care how, what a hot shot you are, how many, you know, mm. what your chops are. Yeah, yeah. You got to be busworthy. That was always a phrase that came up. <laughs> That's awesome. Which means you have to have people skills. Yeah. Because you're going to live on a bus with somebody. Yeah. You can be the best of anything you ever heard. If yeah. you can't get along with people, at some point the bus will pull off the side of the road. <laughs> get out. The door will open, <laughs> and it'll be a foot in your ass <laughs> kicking you out of the bus. Pardon my language. No, no, no. But that's 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 the way. That's the reality of it. Uh, to this day, that's that's very important. Peter seems like a really, I mean, just from interviews and just watching, you know, videos, and I've watched videos with you with him. He just seems like a really nice guy. Is that fair? Is that a fair assumption? Who are we talking about? Peter. Peter Frampton. Oh yeah, he's great. I spent the better part of thirty-one years in his band. He just seems like uh, a just really friendly person. Like oh hello, you know, just like a gentleman. Well, what, I, what I noticed about, <clears throat> and I'm going to be. This is a generalization, but it's a generalization that comes through me uh, actually being mindful about it and and keeping a, a little invisible uh, log of this. I have an affinity for British musicians. Absolutely. Because what I've noticed, having worked with a lot of them, and, mm -hmm. and live and uh, and in the studio, the British players, the music is always at the top of the list. The rock star thing is below that. <laughs> it's not always the case with the American guys. I believe I'm that. I'm an American guy, but I'm not a rock star. I work for them. That's the right, way I always right. look at it. You know? uh, but that's one thing I've noticed, uh, and it's carried through for, for decades. The English guys are doing it for a different their priority is slightly different. You know? That makes sense, and it pro just it's probably the it, it's the work ethic. You know, the work eth ethic of the of the English is probably a lot stronger than the. I mean, I don't want to sit here and generalize a whole country, but you know, it's. it's I, mean, I think it's yeah. a fair yeah. assumption to say the work. I mean, you know, look at the Beatles at the Cavern Club. I mean, they worked, yeah. man. They worked. Yeah. Eight well, hour shifts. Everyone, you know. Yeah. When we started playing, none of us. You know, and we used to have this discussion with it. None of us. We were playing music. Because this is this one other thing I tell young. You know, if somebody asks me, what what's one thing do you have to tell an up and coming musician? Mm. I said, if you're going to play music, you play it for one reason. 
And that reason is because you can't not play music. That's the only reason to do it. I love it. It's got to be right up there with breathing and eating <laughs> and sleeping and everything else. <laughs> Don't do it because you think you're going to become a rock star and rich no. and famous. No. That's the wrong reason, you know? It's kind of like so, people that collect like collect things. Like it's, like it's like if you're just collecting things just for the money aspect, you're losing the joy of, like, say if you collect baseball cards, you collect toys. It's like do it for the joy of it, you know? That's right. That's it. You hit the nail on the head, my friend. That that I agree with that a thousand percent. And and that's when good things come. You know. It, well, it you all, had a lot of good things. <laughs> I, well, I, again, I've been blessed. I was also blessed with a wonderful wife and family uh -huh. that, that were supportive and you know let me go on the road and not have to worry. Yep. Uh, that was a big part of it, I have to say. Well, of and course. I, I mean, you, you know, your wife's like, okay, see you in a few months. You know, I mean, that's, that's tough. Yeah, yeah. That's got to yeah. put a... And, you know, you know, the one thing we have to say, though, John, is that, yes, all this is... But you are an amazingly talented person. And that's where, really, where it comes from. These people would not want to work with you unless they knew... Yeah, you, you, you seem like... A, a hell of a cool guy. I can tell that. But you're also very talented. And these people did not want to work with you. They wouldn't want to work with you unless you were talented. And John, that's that just that just goes beyond anything. I mean, you think P Peter Frampton, Mick Jagger, you know, Ace Frehley could have their pick. Billy Idol, David Lee Roth, you know, Stephen Stills. They can have their pick of who they want. But they chose you, dude. And that's awesome. You know, that's right. You're, you're, you're very kind and. I forgot to ask her, where did you want that check sent to? <laughs> the 50 cents you can put in. <laughs> Escrow. Oh, no, God bless you. I, I, I appreciate that. That, mean, that means a lot to me. Uh, I, I, like I said early on, I, I've, I've been f more fortunate than I ever could have dreamed in my life. So, oh, I've had a great uh, And you're still doing it. That's the thing. It's not like... It's yeah, not I mean, we, I can hit the ground running this year. There's, I, I got a... Uh, yeah, tell us what's going on. What do, what do you got coming up? And yeah, and the website and all this. What people? Yeah, what, what do you got coming up? Well, what, right, there's a bunch of things going on. Uh, we talked about the band uh, with Todd. Yes, with Todd. Yeah, uh, and we have a name which I cannot divulge yet. But okay, I love the name. Okay, and, uh, that that we're working hard on that. And uh, I can't wait. You'll be the first to know. Yes. The other thing, uh, one of the other things that's really cool is through Facebook again. <clears throat> I became good friends with this gentleman by the name of Tom Allen, mm. who is a spectacular uh, guitar player uh, out in the Pacific Northwest area. Mm -hmm. uh, he did tons of work in L.A., you know, sessions and uh, movie scores and stuff like that. He and his partner, uh, Matt Malley. Now, Matt was a bass player from Counting Crows. Oh. They have this... Uh, who are Bay Area band from Berkeley. Definitely. Yeah, he's got this concept called Malleable Records. And what he wants to do is he wants to put together like a wrecking crew type, you know, just... Hal Blaine, Hal Blaine. Yeah, kind of, yeah. so he wants to put a bunch of players together so that when artists go to Malleable Records, he can have a stable of musicians oh, on board. That's um, awesome. And I, I was honored that, that he even asked me and I'm going to be working with those guys, and that's that's really exciting to me. Oh, that's uh, going to be, keep me keep keep me posted on all that, and also anything you. Of course, John, just to put put it out there again, it's like anything that you have coming out. Always send me stuff, you know, because I'll play it. I'll play it here. I'll play it on my Wednesday show. And so, so you got the you got the you got the you got the um you have the the record the record label. Yeah, the malleable records. Malleable. I mean, he's got. He's got. Uh, an amazing drummer Thomas Lang, uh, Brian Bassett, uh, Jamie. O I got Jamie Oldacre on oh. the Rob Arthur from who is playing keys with Frampton now. Oh, cool! Who was in the last uh, version of Frampton's band with me? Uh, and Jamie played on the second oh, Jamie Come was, and played with Jamie Clapton, Clapton and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Chad Cromwell is, is in the stable. He's an amazing uh, drummer who was in Peter's band when we did live in Detroit, uh, which was. The first 5.1 high def DVD that, that oh. was ever recorded. Wow! Uh, and Chad's a like quadruple A session player out of Nashville, and one of my dearest friends, as oh. is Jamie and and uh, and Rob. So that's going to be exciting. There's going to be a bunch of projects happening there. Oh, that's going to be great! And then um, I'm headed down to um, Lumberton, North Carolina. Uh, Why? I'm I'm going to be there with Jamie Oldacre. Uh, this a um, Another friend from Facebook, James Bass, is involved in this thing called Bookham, North Carolina. And it is a really, really wonderful uh, event that they put together. 
they found uh, what the link is between literacy and crime. And it, it's an event that's going to raise money to get books to all kids and get them oh, reading, fantastic. get them interested, but also get them involved in music because, you know, a lyric is like a, is like a, a book. It's like a story. Absolutely. A lyric to a song is a book. Absolutely. So I'm going to be headed down there uh, uh, February 22nd in Lumberton, oh. North Carolina for Bookham. And Jamie Oldacre is going to be there because Jamie's in the middle of writing a book about his, uh, his escapades. Uh, oh, wow. Like, with Clapton and... Uh, Ace and... And, you know, re really, I'm going to back way up. The first band I toured with was this band, was called Bolangus, which is Frankie Previtt, Frankie and the Knockouts, etc., oh, yeah, et cetera. Right, et cetera. Right, right, this right. was in 1972. We're opening in the Midwest for Bob Seger. Yeah. And at the time, who was the drummer? It was Jamie Oldacre. And wow. I ended up in Frampton's band with him in 1979, and we talked about that night that we played together. And it's just small world, my friends. Oh, it's, it's, small it's very world, small world, and and these and these are people that have remained lifelong friends. You know, I that, can tell you, you still talk to them. You still talk to me. It is the best part. So, John, we are we are just about out of time. Definitely going to do a part two. Um, anytime, anytime. Oh, it's you're a joy. Joy. Well, oh, you are too. <laughs> thank you, yeah. John. Well, you know, I'm a fan of music. I love music. I love what you do, and you know, I said I said this to to Robert last week. I said this even to Robbie Rist from the he's, he's an actor. I said, you know, it, it's all that stuff is. It, I mean, I love. I mean, I'm a total pop culture guy, especially this stuff. But it's that you guys are all so cool to me, and you treat me well. And I, I've always said that that goes further with me than anything. And again, I said this to you earlier. I really appreciate it, John, and I appreciate you giving me time. We're definitely going to do a part two, and we're going to talk about the tomatoes in full because <laughs> <laughs> any any time. And you know what? Uh, it, right back at you with all of those nice things. Cause Thank it, you. Look, and to everybody, we're all riding around in the same big blue ball spinning. And so <laughs> That's right. We're all, we're all, and everybody is connected to everyone else, you know, in this world. So Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you for, for, for uh, the wonderful interview and no anytime. Problem. I I'm thank here you. for you. Thank you, John. Take care of yourself. This is uh, the Bob's Radio Cafeteria. John will, John will be back, and this week I'll post the interview. I'll be recording it, so I'll post it. John, I hope all is well with you. Keep in touch, and we will talk very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye for now, my friend. Bye-bye, John. There he is, John Reagan. Oh, what a great interview that was. What a great guy.